Let's continue to look to the majesty of God as he's revealed himself in his word, specifically in the book of Exodus. We return back to our series begun several months ago, to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19, and we'll be studying the entire chapter, uh, but to orient you to kind of the the crux of the matter, the, the great climax of this particular passage. I would just read for us to begin verses 16 to 20. Just listen, look, read. Exodus 19, 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. The most scared I think I've ever been in my entire life was about three months into marriage. That is not the time that you want to display fear. You want your bride to be assured that you could handle anything, anytime. but I was overwhelmed by fear to the point that I was not physically able to move. I never had it happen in my life. I've been on roller coasters. I used to like to go into haunted houses. Like I had experienced like some some pretty, I think, challenging things. I had this unique penchant as a child, I don't know why, for jumping off tall buildings or bridges. I mean, like, I considered myself to be like a a pretty fearless individual, and as it happened, it was nothing but a, um, a bolt out of the blue that woke us up from sleep at like 6.15 in the morning in this hundred-year-old farmhouse that could have caught fire uh, like the driest grass on the prairie out in Kansas. And it struck the tree right in front of the house, and it was so loud, and it was so powerful, and it was so sudden that I was not literally able to move. I just sat there like a coward and grabbed my wife and thought, if the house is on fire, we're going to burn up together. I don't know how long it took like for me to actually move. I, I was like listening listening for like the crackling of a fire. I was waiting to like smell smoke, but I couldn't do anything about it. And eventually, what felt like hours later, but was probably only minutes, I worked up the nerve to go up to the upper floor of this building to check to see whether it was on fire, and thankfully it was not. It was embarrassing. It was absolutely, absolutely humiliating. And it was nothing more than just God's ordinary display of power and thunderbolt and lightning. Have you experienced that any in the last couple of weeks here in Southwest Florida? (laughs) It was amazing to me just a few days ago reading this text to the staff and planning this service Wednesday afternoon. And while we're reading it, not making this up. 
the windows are shaking because of the lightning striking around us outside. It was fearful and amazing. What an interesting way for God to reveal himself in thunderbolt and lightning. Why do you think that is? Why would God reveal himself to his people in thunderbolt, lightning, and earthquake as opposed to butterflies and waterfalls? He could have manifested his presence in any way he desired. Like, what's he going for? Does he actually intend for us, his people, to be scared of him in some way? Have you ever considered that? I mean, when you're reading through your Bible, for example, you'll find scores of passages that will tell you, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. And guess what you'll also find? Scores of passages that say, fear the Lord. Where do we fit in that? Do we fear him or do we not? Churches have wrestled through this. Believers have wrestled through this for thousands of years. But what we see manifested today is typically two approaches. One is to say, we do actually not need to fear God whatsoever. Christ has come he, we are close to him now. Things are familiar. I mean, you're supposed to just feel just like warm, comfortable vibes from God. Fear is something under the old covenant. It's not something that anyone in, like in this day and age who believes in Jesus should ever experience. And so what they're exalting is God's imminence, his nearness to us. But what happens is they're actually denying his transcendence, his holiness, the fact that he's other than us, over us. But I don't know that that's quite the solution because like when you read through the book of Revelation or even when you see Jesus showing up and doing some of his most amazing miracles, what was it producing in the hearts of the people around him? Fear, awe, dread. God did not lose his majesty so as to come into our particular space. He only added to, the Son only added to himself humanity, never losing the transcendent, the holy. So some people are like, all right, well, in light of this over-familiar culture with God and people only stressing his love and his grace, you know what we really need around here? We really need a little more fear of God. And so some churches are trying to do an active campaign the other direction to show how fierce and and threatening God can be. Like, we, we need a little bit of love for God, but we also need a little bit of fear for God. We, we need to want to draw near to him, but we also should want to keep our distance from him, which sounds absolutely like schizophrenic. Like, how, how are you really supposed to, like, love and cling to God, but at the same time say, no, I don't want to be around him. He scares me. This text actually sets up the better way. It's not either God is holy or God is loving. It is both God is holy and God is loving. It is not either God is transcendent or he is imminent. It is both transcendent and imminent. And our fear of him, our awe of him is charted in four movements in this story about meeting with God. That's what the story is about, a meeting with God and how you prepare for that and how that particular meeting would shape and change you. What we've seen in Exodus up to this point is 19 chapters of God rescuing his people from Egypt. That's been the emphasis. He's pulling them out of Egypt. And now for the remainder of Exodus into Numbers and then into Deuteronomy and, of course, Leviticus, which I forgot and most people do. It's all in there. They're at Sinai. They're, 
they ain't moving. It's, it's 19 chapters of just getting them to this point, and then like the rest of the book is them sitting at this mountain in interaction with God. And here's what we need to remember, friends. God's design for his people from the very beginning was not only to rescue them from Egypt, but to reconcile them to himself in the land that he had promised. And the only thing standing in the way now of their utter reconciliation to God is Sinai, this mountain, this meeting with God. Will they actually enter into this relationship that he's offering them to be his special people? And so through this story, we learn our proper response to a God who would call us into relationship with himself. Is it fear? Is it love? Is it both? Let's note the story, then we'll point out the significance. There's four movements in Exodus 19 that help us navigate the right approach uh, to God. They are as follows, invitation, preparation, revelation, and I'll tell you the fourth one later. Look at the invitation in verses 1 to 9, the invitation. On the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped there in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. And the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. Now this is leading to that rather ominous moment where God descends upon the mountain with thunderbolt and lightning and earthquake. But I want you to notice that the context for this is not that they had disobeyed him in some way. God is inviting them into this special relationship with him. In fact, it is all of grace up to this point. All of grace. Like, they've been wandering through the the wilderness, and God has provided for them every step of the way. And I love that grace-charged language that you see, particularly as they are encamped before that mountain. God says to Moses in verse 4, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. What's the first thing he did? I eliminated your enemies. Then the second, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So he eliminated their enemies. He then brought them to himself, himself, and then notice this, or excuse me, the bore on eagles' wings is to actually bring him to himself and brought you to myself. There's a relational component, like it is, they, they drew, he drew them near. Like, the emphasis so far is on what God has done for them, his kindness to them. 
Like, I love the fact that it says, all right, I've brought you to myself on eagle's wings. I always wondered what that means. And um, contrary to what would make a great sermon illustration, eagles do not carry their eaglets around on their wings. So <laughs> um, just, yeah, for you bird lovers out there, it would that'd be cool. But they do, actually, when they nudge the baby eagles out of the nest, they fly near. And golden eagles, in particular, have been known to actually catch their children when they fall and bring them back to the nest. The point is God's supernatural, miraculous intervention. They could not bail themselves out of certain situations, and so he took this most majestic image and said, I'm the one that's picked you up. It reminds me of um, Tolkien and, and his, <laughs> his eagles that just kind of like magically swoop in at convenient times, in The Hobbit in particular, Kind of making you wonder, like, why the whole story ever had to take place about getting this ring to Mordor if the eagles just couldn't take him over there in the first place. But that's another story. (laughs) But truly, in this instance, like, God just took him exactly where they needed to be. He had shown up every time. He had brought them to himself. Like, he loves them. He's poured out, like, good on them. And, And notice how he now is inviting them into this special relationship with him. He says, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Notice what he's saying. Like, I've already poured out my love on you. I've already brought you into relationship with myself. And for anybody who was actually believing and trusting in Yahweh, like they were already experiencing his salvation. But what he is actually inviting them into here is a fuller experience of that. I mean, he had already told Abraham unconditionally, like, look, I'm going to make your name great. And what does it say about Abraham? He believed and it was counted unto him as righteousness. And then here, he actually connects it to those Abrahamic promises by calling them like the house of Jacob, like the family of Israel. Like th- This is an extension of that, but there was something that was promised that they now had the chance to enjoy further, and that was impact on a world around them. Notice what he calls them to. He says, if you'll obey... Everything that I've commanded you, you'll be able to basically live out the original purpose for which I created mankind. Here's what it says in verse 5. If you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. Now think of that. The treasured possession, like that's like the, the crown jewels, if you will, in, in God's treasure chest. Like yeah, I made all the peoples, notice this, it's all the peoples for all the earth is mine. Like I, I value humanity, but I will value you in a way that's special. It's a special love, not just a general love. And you shall be to me, listen to this, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Israel would not only have access to God... They would be the means by which others would have access to God. They would not just be a kingdom like in and of themselves. They would be a kingdom marked by priesthood. Like from them would come one who would actually like bring others into this close special relationship with God. A kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Like this was God's plan all along. They would be able to enjoy God's blessing, but they would also be able to broadcast it. And the requirement, though, to actually fulfill this particular phase of God's special saving plan, though, is steep. Don't miss it. It says, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant. This was conditioned upon their obedience 
Which brings us to a huge question. I mean, you've got to be asking yourself, so was this relationship with God that, that they were going to enjoy, was it something that was by grace? <laughs> or is it something that was like by works? Because it sounds a little confusing at first. It's all by grace up to this point. To be clear, God has taken the initiative to have them enter into relationship with him. But he will emphasize like the aspect of full and total obedience for the fruit of that relationship to enjoy its intended end. And so what does that mean for salvation? Well, let's admit, friends, that the old covenant way of accessing God was indeed inferior to the new covenant way of accessing God. But let me maintain some really clear language here. God has always saved his people by grace through faith. It's just under the old covenant, it was a, it was a car. <laughs> this wasn't a modern car. It was a version 1.0. Like the, the new covenant was better because it was faith in Christ, and the way to express that faith was purely by calling on his name, like believing in him. And yet for them under the old covenant, like they expressed that faith in much more complicated ways and which, with much more difficulty. We'll see it in the laws to come, but instead of them just like believing by faith, they were to express this through an entire long list of rituals and sacrifices that would help them express that and convey that. And in addition, they also didn't have the Holy Spirit living inside them to energize that obedience that would actually make them fruitful. You're going to see time and time again, Israel fail miserably. Like they never really begin to live out their fruitful occupation in light of the whole world because like they didn't have all that they needed yet. God was setting them up for something greater. And yet for all those who were believing, they still had all already been saved in the way that we think about it. The relationship is by grace. The blessing is through obedience, but it's not just any obedience. It would take per perfect obedience for this to be fleshed out through the world. But it reminds us, friends, that God has reconciled us to himself, not just for our personal enjoyment, for the reconciliation of the peoples around us. When we enter into God's saving purposes by grace, he intends for us to then show that grace to others. Peter picks up on this very language and he applies it to the believers in the New Testament. And what is it that he says of them? You are a special chosen holy people, a royal priesthood. Like this is your obligation to live out this blessing and to make others know of the goodness and greatness of the God that you now enjoy. They had entered into this relationship at God's invitation. But there's a second movement. W when this invitation happens, Moses then lets that no makes that known to the people, and they joyfully enter into this, by the way. Again, no, there's no drama here. Like, the God of the universe who has already rescued them and brought them to himself, like, he's inviting them into this, like, special opportunity to be the nation that recaptures blessing for the entire world. Like, who would turn that down? They said, basically, are you willing to do it, this? Are you willing to obey God with all your heart? And they're like, yes, we'll do it. The rest of it at this point is just details. Like, once you've made the commitment, like, once you've been relationally won over, it's like, okay, well, yeah, y'all just work it out. You know what it's like when you have a business deal and, like, you've overcome the relational hurdle? You're like, okay, we're going to have my people call your people and we'll figure out the details. Basically, what's happened is we trust one another. We're going to enter into this relationship. We'll work out the formalities to come. They're saying at the outset, like, okay, relationally, yes, we, we're won by your love. Like, we get it. And whatever you say, we'll do. We want to do that. And it's going to be formalized like in a, in a meeting. It's like, a, it's like an engagement in some ways. We've had the opportunity here um, 
the sea. Uh, people get married in all kinds of ways and meet one another in all kinds of ways. And it's just interesting to me how God's providence works in bringing us to our spouse and to our mate. And yet what is going on in this particular marriage, if you will, this union, is that Israel has been interacting with God in rather indirect ways. Uh, through Moses in particular, he'll, he'll make himself known, but he has not yet directly communicated with them. Do you remember back in Exodus 3? Moses is in this same area. He's in Sinai. And God shows up in flaming fire, engulfing a bush, and says, I'm going to make you a special nation. And he uses y'all as the plural. And he's talking to Moses about Israel. Now, Israel is entering in on this with God. They, basically, God's been emailing them, if you will, and now he's going to show up in person. He's invited them into this, and they're like, yeah, we, we want this. And in light of the fact that he says, okay, well, I'm going to show up and formally make myself known to you so that we can, like, shake hands on this deal, if you will, now preparation needs to be made. We move from invitation to preparation. God tells Moses graciously, you need to get these people ready to meet with me in this way because it is life-threatening. Look at uh, verse 10. It says, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. And when the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. And so Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people and washed their garments. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. Fascinating. Three days. They've got three days to get ready. It's the day of the speech, then there's the next day, and then God's going to show up on the next day. And Moses is told to go and consecrate the people. This is the word that we use for holy, kadosh. It basically means to set apart for a special purpose. Like we, we give it such like a religiously charged connotation all the time, you kind of forget what the word means. But we know what it's like to set things apart for special purposes. Well, at least growing up in my kind of southern habitat, it was like, a rite of passage at a wedding, for example, to do this whole wedding shower deal. And one of the things that you were expected to put on your registry at a southern wedding is China. What is China? It's the plates that you set apart for Christmas and Easter. You don't use them any other time. Those are special plates. Now, I, you know, looking back on it, I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> I get it. Even in some houses uh, in the South, maybe you have these, there's a china hutch, which is a big expensive, expensive piece of furniture to store the china that you don't use except for at Christmas and Thanksgiving. Whoever like, think, thought of it, this was capitalism at its best. You know, like, <laughs> just buy, if you replace one, you got to spend you know, hundreds of dollars to find the replace. Anyway, it's special. It's set apart. It's not ordinary. Uh, people wear, for example, when they go to a special event, they'll buy, they have special clothes. You, you have a tuxedo. You wear a formal gown. They're, it's special. It's different. It's not what you wear out in the garden. It's, it's what you do when you're going into a special place. What Moses is instructed to do here is to prepare the people, like to set them apart in a special way to meet with God. He's basically telling them, this is a big deal. Well, back up for... Just a second. Think of those categories of transcendence and imminence. God is going to come near, imminence. But he's still reminding them that he is transcendent. 
This isn't just any old Joe they're going to be hanging out with. It's the God of the universe, and therefore they need to be ready. This is a special event. So Moses gets them ready. And how does he do that? Well, he does it the best ways that he knows how. He tells the people that you need to wash your clothes. And as a 21st century Westerner, you're thinking like, oh, well, I think that's a great idea to do every day. But guess what? In a desert, you don't get to wash your clothes every day. And if you did wash them, it would take hours. So God is telling them, like, all right, get your stuff clean. Like, put on your best. Who knows the last time they were actually able to wash clothes? They're still getting water from a rock several miles away. So he says, wash your clothes. Why? Because this is special. It symbolizes purity. And then the other thing that he tells them is like, hey, and, and when he shows up, He's going to show up on the mountain, and we're going to set up a border around this thing, like some caution signs, and do not go past the border. Do not touch the mountain. You may draw near to God. He's inviting you close to him, but you cannot be but so familiar with him. And again, this is an old covenant stipulation. I would just mark that for you now. But he's like, don't let anyone get close to it. By the way, if someone touches it accidentally and they die, don't even touch that guy because I'm going to kill you because he transgressed the borders of familiarity. Like it, it was a breach to get too close to one in a position of power. And then the last one is, throws off uh, many married people. Why does Moses say, do not go near a woman? Do not have an intimate relationship with your wife. Does it mean that that is somehow dirty, that relationship is dirty, and therefore when you're going to the presence of God, you should not be participating in that relationship? Absolutely not. It's, not, it's no more sinful to enjoy a physical relationship with one's spouse than it is for someone to have dirty clothes. It's just a special event that's going on, and God says, I want your focus to be on me. This isn't about your normal union. In fact, 1 Corinthians 7 marks out, even under the New Covenant, special times when husbands and wives should refrain from being together because of a higher and holier focus or purpose. He's saying, this is not just some ordinary meeting. This is a big deal. This invitation requires preparation. Make sure that you're ready for this, this next day. This is a life-threatening event. And so Moses actually gets them ready, and then we move from their preparation to this revelation of God in verses 16 to 20. And we already read it, but look again at verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders, plural, it's in the Hebrew is plural, we say thunder and lightning, singular, like Moses really wants you to know that there was a lot of action going on in the atmosphere. Thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. So like this, this fog, this cloud, is, it, like, it wrapped the entire mountain in a very loud trumpet blast. Remember, he said that do not even get near the mountain until the loud trumpet blast and then you can approach. I can imagine what it'd be like to be at five, you know what, I can't imagine, I was about to say, I can't imagine what it's like to be at like 6.15 in the morning, and then all of a sudden to hear the loudest sound you've ever heard in your life, and like, oh, I've, I, well, actually, I have experienced that, and it's terrifying. <laughs> I mean, a whole rude awakening, like for everybody, millions of people, all woken up at this time, and it's like, okay, it's time to go, we're, we're ready, and they make that sleepy walk to the mountain of God, but it's not sleepy for long because that, that sound is loud and it gets louder and louder. And they've never seen a display like this. It says that the whole camp trembled. I ask you, friends, have you ever been that scared? So scared where your body was involuntarily shaking. This was a life-threatening response. Like, and, and, and Moses brings them, though. He, he brings them out of the camp. And notice, it's Moses who brings the people to meet God. God is everywhere present, but God does not specially make himself known everywhere. 
God, in a special, unique way, has made himself known. And it says that they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. So they've put themselves in position. And just see the picture here. The whole mountain is wrapped in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. So fire is covering the entire mountain. This is not a volcano. This is supernatural fire. Just as the fire was burning the bush and it was not consumed, somehow this stone mountain was on fire. It reminds me of Monday night being at a church member's house who had uh, by their pool a bunch of stones with the fire that went up right, right through the stones. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. There's, there's no wood there. There's just a fire burning. It, like, that was the picture here. It's just the fire is around the entire mountain. The smoke is descending, I mean, ascending from all around. It says it went up like the smoke of a kiln. This isn't some little campfire, you know, like that you've made before that just kind of like irritates the nostrils. I mean, this is like a plume from a nuclear reactor going up miles into the sky, and the whole mountain is shaking from this thunder. It's getting louder and louder. And when Moses speaks to God from the base of the mountain, like the people can't fully understand God, but it is this powerful, booming voice that sounds like thunder. Friends, God is not revealing himself here with butterflies and waterfalls because he wants them to understand that he is over and above them. He is greater than them. He does not exist for their convenience. They exist for his. He is not afraid of them. They should be afraid of him. He is the master. They are the, the smaller. He, like He is the creator. They are the created. Like, he's putting them in their place, in their position. Like, there is a, a prominence, an intentional lifting up of God as someone greater and more powerful because he indeed has that power. It's like the medieval thrones of, of Western Europe. Why, they're always elevated and huge, and there's, there's, there's shields on the wall of conquered peoples. I mean, like, it's, it's letting you know that this person has authority, this person has power. And so the revelation, though, is, is absolutely, like, debilitating. It says that they trembled greatly, and Moses is trying to interact with them in this. And, and things just, they go from actually bad to worse for them. Because what happens is, and just hang with me for a second, flip over. God continues to meet with them. He speaks to them directly in chapter 20, giving them the Ten Commandments, but go to the end of this in verse 18, Exodus 20, verse 18. Notice how they felt through this whole thing. When all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood afar off. They were drawing near to God. They were going away. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear. God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. Do you see now why God shows himself in this way? He is manifesting for them, like ahead of time, the huge consequences that would come if they would disregard his good commands and try to break off this covenant relationship. He's like, I'm doing this so that you would know that you don't mess with the living God of the universe. You were entering into covenant, not just with one of your best friends from the neighborhood growing up, but almighty God of the universe. But the crazy thing is that when we think back to our original question, well, how do we then interact with God? It leads us to wonder, is this really what he intended? He has invited them in, but it seems like from Exodus 19 alone, hang with me, it seems like he's keeping them at arm's length. Like he literally put up boundaries and said, don't touch the mountain lest you die. Is this the way that he intended for it to be? Like, were they really supposed to enjoy relationship with him, or were they supposed to back off? 
Which leads us to the final movement, and it kind of begins to answer the question. We've noticed so far the invitation into God's presence, the preparation for God's presence, and then the revelation of God's presence. But now we get to that final point. What's God doing in creating these boundaries? He's communicating that they would always need mediation to enter his presence. Mediation. That's the final movement. Notice what God says to Moses when he goes up to the mountain in verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord, to look, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. Pause there, that should cause a question. You're like, priests? There's no priests yet. Well, in actually ancient culture and society, typically like the firstborn was already set apart to be able to be like a religious mediator for families. We saw this with Jethro as he was like a priest of Midian. And already back earlier in the book of Exodus, God put a special assignment upon the firstborn and said they were going to be used in a special way. When the law is fully revealed later, we find out that those firstborn sons of Aaron would be the ones who would serve as priests. But the point here is not who are the priests, the point is the comparison. Not only should like ordinary people that we think of like not draw near, but even those who think themselves to have closer access to God, a priest, even they need to be careful not to break through and act overly familiar with me, lest the Lord break out against them, verse 22 says. And Moses said to the Lord, this is a good comment, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. So Moses is like, hey, you've already told us this. It's not like, why do I need to go down and tell them this again? And God is warning us through this second and third warning because you're coming up to the mountain Moses people could think oh well Moses went up to the mountain I can go up to the mountain too it's always easy to start to think that God is just a little more accessible to us than he actually is he's like never forget that unaided apart from my direct invitation and my preparation you cannot enter my presence Moses you are the mediator you are the intercessor you are the go-between this relationship will run through another that's how the old covenant worked verse 24 and the Lord said to him go down and come up again bringing Aaron with you but do not let the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Friends, this relationship with God, with all of the intimacy that is intended, can only be accessed through the mediation of another. You yourself do not directly enter into God's presence. You need another. That's what the text is saying. It will always run through another. And so Moses is the mediator of this old covenant. And because it's a human, like mediating this covenant, the thing ends up being, like sorry to spoil the story for you, a hot mess. Moses sins. He doesn't know how to convey God's words the best to the people. He doesn't represent the people very well before God. He does some good things. But they're going to learn over the course of several hundred years that they need a different mediator than Moses. They need somebody who can actually like, walk up to the top of the mountain and say, I have faithfully fulfilled all the obligations of the law. 
They need someone who is absolutely satisfied every righteous demand of the holy God Almighty on their behalf, thereby crediting that righteousness to all who are represented by him. They need a mediator who would be able to come and have so much righteousness that he would be able to lay out his own life and sacrifice himself so that they could enjoy forever presence with God because the penalty had been fully paid. They need one better than Moses. They need one like the Messiah, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who outlasted God's wrath, provided righteousness, and rose again the third day as vindication that God approved his sacrifice for all who believe in him. That's what it's about. No, you cannot draw too near to God on your own, but through the mediator. You enter into his very presence. That's what Hebrews 12 was all about. Did you notice it earlier? When these... When these Jewish Christians were tempted to leave the faith on account of persecution, the author of Hebrews has been arguing, no, you've got a better covenant. Don't go back to that old that old one. Like like that didn't get the the job done. Like he says, under that one, like you you came up to a mountain like ablaze with fire and you couldn't even like draw near. It was like stay back, stay back, stay back. But now through the mediation of Christ, you've entered into a better covenant. And he says, draw near. Listen to it again from Hebrews 12, 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. It's talking about Christ. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less we will escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Like, don't reject the mediator. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And this phrase, yet once more, indicates that the removal of the things that are shaken, that is, the things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. God is still a consuming fire, but now we can draw near. Speaking of the Hobbit, I've had the opportunity to listen to that uh, story read to me with my middle son over the last, I don't know, a couple months. We're taking our time with it. And... um, I'm not as cultured as I like to be. I've never read the book myself. I've seen the movie. Uh, But listening to the story read has been a fascinating uh, experience just because of the the storytelling, the way that Tolkien can draw people into the, the fear of a particular situation, and especially the character, the hobbit, because hobbits are small. Like, they're just easily threatened. Like, I think, you know, their, their greatest superpower is to be able to sneak around quietly. And so there's this particular instance, inst- interestingly, after the whole Eagles incident, in which they start, like, charting through this kind of, like, unknown territory, and they've been, like, just a wash of all their resources. They've lost all their ponies. They've lost all their bags. I mean, it, <laughs> It's the dwarves, a hobbit, and a tall wizard making their way through the forest without provision. And then Gandalf begins to actually say to them, you know, I think there's a source of help here. And he begins to describe this this character who he calls a skin changer. This, This one who can turn into a mighty bear or sometimes he actually just comes across as this ultra tall and and ripped guy with black hair. He can just change into any shape and he's got this weird origin you don't know of. Like they think that his line goes back to like before the, the establishment of the mountains, like before the desolation of smog. Like you're you're kind of wondering like who is this guy? 
He sounds, he sounds kind of crazy. And he's warning them, like, I don't know how this is going to go, but, like, he may be of help to us. And then it starts describing him, and he's huge, and, and the hobbit is only, like, coming up to his knees, literally. And he begins to, like, interact with these, with these hobbits, and, I mean, excuse me, with the with dwarves and this little troop, and you're wondering at any point, like, is he going to destroy them? Is he going to turn into a bear? And he, like, you just don't know. He even invites them into his house, and it sounds kind of like a Hansel and Gretel kind of thing. Like, no, 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 don't go in there, you know. But all of a sudden, like, things change. They change when this particular one, Bjorn, goes out and, um, and devastates the threats and the enemies of the troop, particularly uh, killing uh, the great troll, decapitating him, and setting his head <laughs> on a spike outside the house, and then taking the great warg. It was this huge wolf, and actually, like, skinning him and putting the skin on the thing. And this, is, this was the line that stuck out as I was reading. I thought this was so helpful. It says, up to this point, Bjorn was a fierce enemy, but now he was their friend. Do you see the difference between the two? Bjorn didn't change in his intensity. What changed was his orientation toward them. God portrays himself as the mighty one of fire and thunder and earthquake. You should be scared, but listen to this. Christ assures us that this mighty God is for us. He is not our enemy. He is our friend. If you don't catch anything else that I'm saying, friends, please embrace that there are two kinds of the fear of God. I'm going to keep it really simple. There is a wrong fear and a right fear. When the Bible says, fear not, fear not, fear not, it is talking about the wrong fear. You say, well, what's the wrong fear? Well, friends, a wrong fear of God is that which looks at him as creator and mighty and powerful and causes you to want to flee from him. Like you want to get away. This is the same fear that was used in the parable of, of the Minus. Remember where he gives these different gifts to these guys who are supposed to invest in others. And one of the guys, he's invested everything. And the other guy, he invested everything. And they got a return. But there was that third guy. Do you remember what he did? He took his stuff. He buried it. And then when the, the master comes back and asks for an account of like why he did what he did and didn't make any money, you know what he said? I didn't want to do anything because I thought that you were a fearful Lord, a master, like I, I didn't want to mess it up. Friends, that kind of fear of God, the one that says, I don't know that I'm comfortable around you. I don't know that I love a God. Like, like that type of fear is actually like the enabler of eternal damnation. It keeps God at arm's distance from you. If you only see him as creator, but not as redeemer, you will never come to him at all. We need to be careful, friends, that we actually portray God as he's been portrayed in the scriptures. He is not like Orwell's big brother. He's not just numinous power out there that's just like imposing himself on people. He's revealed himself as a father. A father of a son, a father who adopts people into his family. Like he is great and glorious, but he is also gracious and good. That fear of God that would lead us away from him is insufficient. It is inadequate. We don't need more of that. We need the right kind of fear. You say, well, what's the right kind of fear? What's the difference? The wrong fear is only wrong when it doesn't actually lead us to reconciliation with God through Christ. Wrong fear stays in the trembling phase. I don't want to be near God. Right fear begins there. You better fear God. You're a judge, the one who will eliminate all rebels for all eternity. But you need to find refuge 
He's provided refuge. He's provided a means of reconciliation. And so wrong fear moves to right fear through reconciliation through a mediator, that is Christ, and then rejoicing in this new relationship that we now have with this God who is no longer our enemy but our friend. But not because we did something to clean ourselves up or to merit his mercy. It all happens because of the work of the reconciler, of the mediator, of his son. So there's still a fear, but it's not a fear that actually leads you away from God. It's one that leads you to him. It's a fascination. It's an awe. Like, he's for me? Some of the greatest um, Christian leaders of the last four to five hundred years had this fascination with thunder and lightning, as I was discussing earlier. Both Luther and Spurgeon and Jonathan Edwards right of this conflicted relationship they had with thunder and lightning. Basically, you know what the difference was? Before they were saved, they were terrified of thunder. After they were saved, they were fascinated by it. Because they recognized that, like, this was no threat to them. This was God working, and he was their God. He enjoyed relationship with them. In fact, Spurgeon would say that he would go out in a thunderstorm and look around and take it in. Like, that is, that is fear, it is fascination, it is drawing you to that which is dangerous in and of itself, but you know it is for your ultimate good. Um, do you ever get fascinated by the things that you think are the greatest threat to you? A.K.A. as a child, playing with matches? Do you know that thing's going to burn you? Kids don't play with matches. But I'm going to tell you something I've done before, but you shouldn't do this. I had this fascination with, like, a little pyromaniac. Like, I was just, like, wow, you would stare at that flame. You, you ever sit at a campfire and you just stare at the fire? This could destroy you, and yet you're fascinated by it. Why? Because you know that fire is for you. It's not against you. God is still a consuming fire, and yet he is for those who have come to him through faith in the Son. He is still powerful. He is still mighty. He is still other than. And yet, in addition to that, he has welcomed us in. So, friend, be gone with that wrong faith that would lead you only away from God. But instead, embrace that right faith which comes to him through the mediator, the Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. So practically, uh, Justin, what do you intend for us to do with this? It's really simple. Exodus 19 was designed to increase your awe of God Almighty. If you walk out of here seeing God bigger than when you came in, you're blessed. If you know he's for you. And he's only for those who are looking to his son in faith alone. If you walk out of here knowing that God is bigger than you ever thought, but you're not yet in relationship with him, even now, turn from your sin and trust in his son so that he would no longer be your enemy but your friend. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the one who has brought us into a better covenant where we need not fear, where we may now draw near. Perfect obedience has happened, not through us, but through him. So may we embrace you, our God, consuming fire because you've already purged us of our sin through your son's death on the cross. You've already provided us with the eternal life and righteousness of the son for those who believe. And Lord, some are still scared. Some are still on the outside. Some have not yet entered in. Lord, give them eyes to see Christ and his sufficient salvation. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask it. Amen. Let's stand together now and praise this holy God. Mm -hmm.